we said it last week, didn't we, around a fly half. Um, and while Johnny Sexton had a good game but didn't have a completely dominant game, the game was one on physicality. The game was one on accuracy. Um, and the chances that Ireland created, that they scored from, were, were, were the difference in the end. I feel sorry for Willemse. Um He's a decent player. He's a good fullback. He's a good 10. He just had a shocker. Um, yeah, miss kicks to touch. Goal kicking was poor. Cheslin Colby ends up goal kicking. And I said it on here last week, the difference between the two teams at that level, when you've got Johnny Sexton, leader, captain, uh, a million caps, a million years of age, a million years of experience versus a South African team who are bullish, they're powerful, you know, they can go around blitzing people left, right and centre. They've got the bomb squad. But if you haven't got a 10 that can run the game, um, and unfortunately made the errors that they made at 10. Um, that was the difference. And uh, I was so impressed with Ireland, though, to, to soak up some of the the power and, the, and the, the clear outs. And it was just monstrous. It was a war. It was effectively a war in Dublin that their lieutenant, Johnny Sexton, led them to victory. I thought the tackle selection, being a bit of a nose here, Remember Ireland used to do what was called the choke tackle. Can't say choke now. Uh, but they used to tackle high. They used to go high up and target the ball. Then they went away from that and started tackling a lot lower because of, obviously, the stuff around the high tackle. You, you didn't want to uh, get red carded or whatever. But if you look at the tackle selection against South Africa, they got it spot on. They were going high. Peter Omani, uh, we'll love the whole back row. James Ryan as well. Ty Byrne, who I thought again was brilliant. They were targeting the ball, slowing them down. And people talk about South Africa, this power game. They were getting stripped in the tackle as well. So I thought that the, the, their tactics, they just evolved, don't they? Like that's something that they might have done before. I haven't seen it. I've not picked it up as regularly as I did at the weekend. But the tactics and the strategy that they have going into a game. Like I'm watching that. You knew it was going to be close. It was 1916 at the end of the game. And yes, it would have come down to kicks, but just so well coached. And then like me and Goody have spoken about, and when we were chatting to Dan Levy at the live show as well, the physicality that they've brought over the last couple of years, really, and how they've evolved that. And again, you go over old ground lengths to getting beat by La Rochelle in Europe, uh, Ireland being bullied by England as well. And it's just flipped a switch now. The physicality that they showed... And uh, and the forward pass. Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a forward pass. It wasn't. Razzy posted it. It wasn't a forward pass. But the small margins of the game. I thought they did get the rub of the green. It was unfortunate to see Stuart McCluskey, friend of the show, go off as well. I thought he looked wicked. He looked physical. Uh, Rumours are well. Andy Farrell said after that it wasn't as serious. Or we hopes it's not as serious. We've not heard anything. But I thought he looked brilliant coming in for Henshaw. Losing Colin Murray. He looked good. As well, on his break, though, looked like he pulled up with his groin. Ty Furlong as well. So they took a bit of hit in terms of players. But strength and depth, big shout out to Jimmy O'Brien. Tried to get him on the podcast. Everyone wants a piece of him. I thought he was really good when he came on. For Stuart McCluskey, moved to 13 and offered a bit of a different dimension. Not seen much of him. Seen him playing for Leinster a little bit. Everyone's talking about him. But Ireland, strength and depth, physical, tackle selection. Uh, number one team in the world, and they showed why. Well, we can get the lowdown on that win over South Africa now as former Ireland back road. Dan Levy joins us. How are you, mate? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks very much for having me on. World number one against the world champions in Dublin off the back of an unbelievable tour in New Zealand. We knew it was going to be a good game. The physicality was an obvious one. But what did you make of it? I just thought Ireland, again, were just excellent throughout. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um I thought they were unbelievably physical um, from 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 the onset, and in fairness, the South Africans were up for it as well. So it just made for an unbelievable spectacle. Uh, I thought Ireland, you know, there was there was always going to be big questions about the Irish set piece, um, how they'd fare against the big South Africans, um, and also their physicality. And I think they answered both. Um, I think, like, even if you look at, you know, the injuries that Ireland had through the game, you know, Tyke Furlong coming off quite early, Finley Bielham coming on and doing an incredible job. Um, and that would have been a bit of a question mark for Irish rugby on who, if Ty comes down, who's up next and, and, and can they perform? And I think he did a, uh, an outstanding job. I thought James Ryan was unbelievable throughout the whole game. Uh, his physicality, his work um, in set piece, uh, he was absolutely integral. But... You know, I think like one to fifteen, um, and even the bench when they came on as well. I thought they were all unbelievable, and it was uh, it was a really good team performance and one that um, 
Ireland can really take confidence from, um, particularly with the criticism that they've had in the last while where they can't perform against a big, you know, a France or an England or a big power-based team. Um, so they can take a lot of confidence from that. I'm sure there's a few sore bodies um, after the game, but uh, yeah, as I said, it was, it was a huge win for them. And where does that come from in terms of that physicality? Because we've spoken about it on here. You go back two or three years and that was the case. It was what the, the, the comments that were levelled at the team around the physicality. They could play some unbelievable rugby, but now all of a sudden they're monstering the, the biggest monsters in the world in South Africa. They're more physical than England when they play against England. They bullied England. Um, that just hasn't come overnight, has it? It's something that's consciously gone on. And you know, we're not seeing these players putting on 15 kilos and coming back as different animals. It's still the same players, you know, but their physicality has gone through the roof, right? Yeah, I'm sure like in camp. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say many of the lads would be um, listen to the media and tune it into their podcast every week, but you know, oh, they do. No, oh, they, they do. Listen to this one. They love it. <laughs> Humbly, they would listen to this show. I wasn't when I was there, um, <laughs> but um, no, there's definitely you, you, you get things to the grapevine, and you, you, you know that like players would be questioning can Ireland do it against a bigger physical side, so um, they, they would have been challenged from the coaches, but also from. You know the players themselves, um, the leaders in the group, Johnny, Pete, uh, or Gary. Um, they would have all said it themselves. So South Africa was going to come into town. Everyone knew what South Africa were going to do, and um, Ireland were just ready for it. And they they matched them, and uh, in some cases they you know they they outperformed and they did them. So you know it was it was it was a test. It was gone to throw down, and they did very very well. I thought. Just to piggyback what Goody's talking about a little bit, where has it come from with, I mean, Ireland have been there or thereabouts for so many years, but especially over the last sort of five years, they're always now one of the top two teams. And the pipeline of young players coming through is strong as well. It's not just a blip and it's not just a couple of players that have got you guys at the top. Where has that big change come from, do you think? It's a good question. Um you know, you get kind of co- cohorts of players coming through. Um, I think I think if you look at the players like Pete, um, I thought Rory Best was a huge um, sexto. Um, I know they would have been a bit more, that, that would have been towards, not not later in their career, but, um, you know, with, with Bestie's leadership. And I think they just kind of, I think maybe when Joe came in and then, obviously with Farrell as well, that they had this kind of defiant kind of culture about them um, that they kind of aimed to make a bit of history whenever they went out. So, you know, Ireland hadn't beaten the All Blacks until Chicago. Around that time was kind of, you know, the first time they'd beaten the All Blacks, they maybe got a bit of belief uh, going forward from there. And then, you know, then they go down and they get their first win on South African soil. They win a test against the Aussies. They beat Ireland, uh, beat um, the All Blacks in Ireland, and you know, even with with the tour down in New Zealand last year, they're just building. Um, and now, if you're a young player coming through in Ireland, you know, you're seeing the seniors beat, you know, number one team um, this weekend and win a tour um, against obviously New Zealand um, during the summer. So you know, the the kind of shackles are off a little bit in that regard. So. Um, they've always had a good pipeline, but um, now they have, you know, they do have a serious belief and um, and obviously some good young players coming through as well. What about the environment under Andy Farrell? It seems, and it must be well, world number one, all the things we've just spoken about that you've just reeled off there. Compared to Joe Smith, it seems like Joe Smith kind of lost the change room a little bit at the end. Andy Farrell comes in and there's been a huge shift. What are the lads, what are your mates saying about working under Andy Farrell? The goat, <laughs> yeah, they are. They're absolutely loving us. Um, I mean, when Farrell took the reins, uh, I, I, I think he, he his first Six Nations they uh, maybe didn't perform to their best. Um, but but there's a lot of change going on. I think he, um, he asked the players to lead a lot more, and um, the environment was completely different. And um, the players bought in massively, um, and you know they're just being challenged to get better every week and keep getting better and um the camp is in an unbelievable place um 
everyone loves being in camp. They love you know the camaraderie, and when you're getting wins like that as well, what's not to, lo- to love? And they say obviously everyone outside of the squad is, uh, and with the rankings, Ireland are number one team in the world. You're hearing from in- inside the squad the likes of Johnny Sexton saying, "We'll take the praise when we win trophies and stuff like that." The big kind of um, taboo thing around Ireland and World Cups is getting past the quarterfinals. We know you can win Grand Slams. We know you know, you can win Six Nations and everything like that. But is there any chat around that in the in the camp around you know the World Cup being a year away? Is it just next game, next business, let's just keep enjoying the moment now? Or is the thoughts further down the line of what you can achieve in a World Cup? Uh, no, I don't think. I, like, it's a long way. Uh, there'll be a lot of rugby between now and then. Um, I think... I think the Irish boys um, are just trying to get better. Um, they're trying to challenge themselves uh, every time they go out in the field, and um, I think I think you sit back and you 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 rest on your laurels a little bit, which um, you know they're they're number one in the world now, and they they just beat South Africa. They could do. Um, you're in a dangerous spot there, and you're not in a growth mindset. So um, you know, I, I know I know the leaders they have in the group and the players they have. So. They'll they'll already flick the switch now to to Fiji coming to town or just off the back of a good win and they'll I I I'd love to see them mix up the team a lot and give these guys these younger guys and these kind of fringe guys a good opportunity to put their hand up and then we'll see what happens for their last their last game against the Aussies. The million dollar question. Now, people listening to this, Dan, will think you sound unbelievable, which you do, and it's great, and you've got an opinion, you speak clearly. But it is the million dollar question. If it's not Johnny, so say Johnny goes down, say he gets a dead leg, say all his hair falls out and he ain't happy with how he looks, so he refuses to play, who's your 10? Because everything's on Johnny, right? Everyone's talking about Johnny keeping fit. When Johnny plays, Ireland look amazing, which they do. If he's not, who is Dan Levy picking? Um, I think after, I'm going to say the least controversial thing ever at the moment. Um, I, th- I think after Joey's performance against France, um, I think it has to be him. Um, I, I think before that, I was I kind of questioned his form a little bit, but like, you're going to France for a World Cup. You're going to play France in the Stade de France if you want to win it. Um, I thought he was brilliant that day, and it gave me a lot of confidence in him. Um, and I think he's the only real person to stand up in that Irish squad as a 10. Um really tried and tra- tested uh, obviously after Johnny so um as i said you know if 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 i were a coach um which i definitely am not going to be but um i would be i'd be giving these guys opportunities i'd i'd give Johnny a or i'd give Joey a start if Foley's going to be their next option is that if that's who they want i'd start him as well um and just you know like uh, as i said to you guys on on the on the live show I don't really care if they're number one in the world. As a player, I didn't even know. I never knew what our ranking was. I never cared what the ranking was. It's it's all kind of irrelevant noise to me. Um, if you if you lose a couple of games and you blood players the right way, and when it comes around to the World Cup in France, and you have you know two or three viable options because injuries will happen, you're in a way better place um, than being number one in the world. And have Johnny and no one else because you know a lot of injuries happen and Johnny is uh, he's not the young study what once was so um, yeah so we'll see where they go from there. This video is brought to you by Manscaped, the very best in men's below the belt grooming. They're offering all viewers of this video twenty percent off their entire product range and free worldwide shipping with the code RugbyPod. That includes the Lawnmower 4.0 package. So go and use the code RugbyPod at checkout at manscaped.com. Trust us, your balls will thank you, and we can make more videos like this.